Um, so thank you for coming to, um, to the law school's Constitu uh, Constitution Day event. As you may or may not know, Constitution Day is a, uh, a federally mandated event uh, that we have to put on on pain of losing our federal funding. Um, there is a very strong argument that in forcing us to speak about the Constitution on pain of losing federal funding, Constitution Day is itself a violation of the First Amendment. <laughs> Um, and uh, maybe we can ha hash about that issue if you, uh, if you like. Um, so my name is Bill Ariza. I'm a professor here. I teach administrative law, as a couple of my students, freshman class know, uh, and constitutional law and a couple of other classes. Um, and um, I want to introduce our panel um, and then uh, explain sort of how the, uh, uh, how the hour is going to go down. So um, we're going to begin with the three of us, my two colleagues and I, speaking about some cases the court decided this past term and some cases that are under court docket for this term. Um, and then I'll, I'll be, I'll be asked and I'll sort of talk a little bit, a very small amount, uh, about some of the maybe extrajudicial issues that are being raised by the Trump administration, extrajudicial constitutional issues. Um, and, and then we'll open up for Q&A. And so we're going to try and preserve as absolutely as much time as we can for Q&A. So in the service of that, uh, let me introduce my colleagues, and then we'll get the show on the road. Uh, so speaking first is going to be um, Professor Susan Herman at the far end of the table, um, constitutional law professor, president of the ACLU, and uh, overall uh, maven on constitutional law. Um, Next to her um, is another maven on constitutional law, Professor Joel Gora, uh, and I really mean that. Uh, Joel, um, you, you, you may or may not know the Buckley versus Vallejo case. That was the kind of the foundational campaign finance case. Professor Gora was a, um, uh, a crucial component of the ACLU's litigation strategy in that case. Um, one may disagree with the result or not, uh, uh, but, uh, but absolutely Professor Gora is a uh, is a, uh, a key component of the uh, course current jurisprudence on campaign finance. So we're going to begin with Professor Herman and then Professor Gore. Well, thank you, Professor Ariza, and thank you all for being here. Good afternoon, and happy Constitution Day to you all. I'm sure you celebrated in your own personal ways on the actual day. Uh, the first thing that I want to tell you is kind of more my ACLU hat, but I think it's really interesting. The ACLU has five cases in the Supreme Court this year, and you know the Supreme Court only hears like 60 or you know, something or 70. So this is really quite remarkable, and a number of the cases we have yet were part of coalitions. But I'll briefly describe the five cases, some of which you we're going to be talking about, other people are going to be talking about. Uh, one of the cases I'll talk about in a minute is the Carpenter case, which is about is a Fourth Amendment issue on search and seizure. That was the ACLU case out of Michigan. Another one, which I think Professor Gora will talk about, is a case from Ohio about voting rights. It's a case where Ohio purges people off the voting rolls if they haven't voted for two years, the Husted versus A. Philip Randolph Institute. Uh, the third is the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, which I believe Professor Ariza will be talking about. That case, the ACLU of Colorado won in the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. And then there are two um, immigration cases. One is called Jennings versus Rodriguez, and it's coming before the court a second time. It was there that last year, but the court is hearing it again. And that's about mandatory detention of people trying to come into the country who are in special categories and whether or not those people should be entitled to hearings about whether or not they have a right to be released on bond. The fifth case is probably the one you've heard most about, the fifth ACLU case, along with very important coalition partners. So that's the one that I want to start with. And what I want to tell you is that because this is also an immigration case, it's the um, International Refugee Assistance Program pro Project versus Trump case about the travel ban. And I am not an immigration expert, so I'm going to be talking about that case as a matter of constitutional law and constitutional litigation. So what I want to tell you is that if you have important questions, as I'm sure you do, about the immigration law underlying that case, underlying Jennings versus Rodriguez, or about has anybody worried about DACA? Uh, fortunately, um, Professors Fullerton and Kaplow, who are in the back of the room there, are planning to do a ta town hall next Monday at this time, same place? Same place? Okay, on immigration issues. So, you know, you're welcome to throw all the constitutional law questions at us, and if anybody has important immigration law questions today, happily we do have some experts in the room. But, you know, I'm, with that introduction, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the background of Trump versus IRAP, the International Refugee Assistance uh, project, pro pro project, which is about to be argued on October the 10th in the Supreme Court. I'm sure you all know something about it, but just a kind of a little outline of, of what's been happening and how this got set up. 
So on Friday, January the 27th, very shortly after being inaugurated, President Trump issued an order about immigration which suspended entry into the country of hundreds of millions of people. And the idea was that he was suspending the entry for 90 days so that the administration could reconsider what its policies would be, how much they wanted to vet people. It was an order that affected refugees, it affected all sorts of new people, including legal permanent residents who were about to re-enter the country, people who had been granted visas. And so, um, you know, of course, there was an immediate reaction to this. Um, this is you know, Friday afternoon, and you know, something like 5 o'clock, you know, the executive order is issued. And this has been a pattern with the administration, which I think is really interesting. So just you know, from the ACLU perspective for a minute, so this is 5 o'clock um, Friday afternoon that the order comes out. Between about 7 and 9, the ACLU lawyers were on the phone with you know, colleagues at the um, IRAP, the Immigration Project, <coughs> as well as a Yale Law School clinic, an immigration clinic that's run by a former ACLU staffer, talking about, well, you know, what are the unconstitutional things here? What might be the strategy for litigating against this, et cetera? So they get off the phone like, you know, nine or so, you know, planning to think about this more. And by 10 o'clock, they're starting to get texts from IRAP that this order is being applied to people who were actually in the air when the order came down. So IRAP, um, which is actually an association of law students, they work in a number of different law schools, very interesting organization, and they were prepared to help uh, settle into the country some of the people who were entering, including a man named Hamid Darwish. Hamid Darwish is an Iraqi. He had been a translator for the American military, and um, after, uh, it was he, amazing person. He would go out when the American military were wearing their body armor and he'd be wearing his sweatshirt and his baseball cap and you, he would translate for them. He is credited with having saved the lives of quite a number of Americans. But after he was, you know, after that stint, he and his family found that they were getting a lot of grief from some people in Iraq who were not you know, that happy with his having been that helpful to the Americans. So um, he decided, made the difficult decision to move to the United States, spent two years being vetted, you know, applying for the visa, et cetera, and he was on his way to the United States when the executive order comes down and he ends up being detained at JFK. For I think it was like 19 hours they ended up detaining him because you know, it's like, oh, you know, wait a minute, never mind. So what happened was that the IRAP people were prepared to welcome him at the airport. They were right there. And so they called up you know, the coalition, the ACLU people and the people at Yale and this is 10 o'clock Friday night. By 6 a.m. Saturday morning, they filed papers in court in the Eastern District right here, believe it or not. They were up all night, and they had things that actually looked like legal papers. Remarkable. And by that evening, the federal judge in the Eastern District here had issued an order um, in joining the travel ban, saying, wait a minute, you, know, you cannot keep this person out. Well, you all know, too, I'm sure, that there were cases around the country. There was a big one in the Ninth Circuit brought by the Washington State challenging the travel ban. And there were really you know, over a dozen cases around the country raising similar challenges. Now, some of the things that the judges were finding very upsetting included one, uh, one thing about the um, initial travel ban was that it did not exempt legal permanent residents. So there were a lot of people who had been lawfully in the United States who had just been traveling, and then we were told, you know, maybe they can't come back at all, even though they have their families and their lives here. There was also an explicit exception in the initial travel ban for um, Christians in predominantly Muslim countries. And this was, you know, kind of the, the Trump administration siding with, if you are a Christian who's in a predominantly Muslim country and you want to come to the United States because you're fleeing you know, what you say is oppression, that's totally different from if you're a Muslim or if you're somebody in Syria who wants to, you know, flee the, the horrors that are going on there. So the other problem there, you know, another problem, was that the order was believed to violate the Establishment Clause because the government was preferring one religion to another and coming down on that side of things. Well, you probably also were aware that after the courts kept ruling that the initial order was unconstitutional in several different ways, the Trump administration decided to retreat. So they issued a revised executive order on March the 6th, and the dates become relevant here for a reason I'll tell you in a minute. March the 6th becoming effective on March the 16th. And what they tried to do was try to make the order a little bit more litigation proof. They exempted the legal permanent residents. They said, oh, never mind about the Christians. We didn't really mean that. And you know, a couple of other things were different. Instead of um, rule, categorically uh, keeping people out from seven different countries, they decided to reduce it to six, and they decided not to have the, the kind of absolute treatment of people from Iraq. So Hamid Darwish did okay. You know, he ended up being able to stay. He had a pretty traumatic experience, but you know, his case ended up mooting out. Uh, I can also tell you that the ACLU and the coalition partners have now settled 
the lawsuit against you know, travel ban number one, you know, the broader one. And the administration has agreed to go back and look at some of the people who were just automatically kept out under that ban. So you know, that's underway. However, travel ban number two is now what is being litigated. So I want to tell you a little bit about how this case came up in Maryland, because I think one of the big issues in this case is standing. Who has the st standing to challenge the travel ban on different grounds? So among the, the 12 different cases, this one um, came up in Maryland. So in addition to IRAP, which is the name plaintiff here, the, again, the Law Student Project in many different law schools, um, there were a number of individuals, both US citizens and legal permanent res residents whose families are affected by the order and can't come into the country, you know, or at least are in danger of not being able to, because they have um, visa applications or um, asylum petitions or you know, whatever they have. So their family members are trying to raise a challenge on their behalf. Why is that? It's because people who are non-Americans who are not in the United States do not have the same constitutional rights as Americans. So somebody who is Iraqi or you know, Syrian cannot raise the claim that, the, that there's a violation of the Establishment Clause. They don't have those rights. Those rights belong to Americans. So the administration has been arguing that the people who are raising this claim aren't really hurt and that they don't have standing. Um, as to the individuals, what they're saying is we are being hurt. You know, Muslims are being singled out. And even though the administration left out the mention of Christians versus Muslims in order number two, that's still what this is all about. You know, that's what inspired this. So that's one big argument. So in addition to the individual plaintiffs, there's IRAP and there are two other or organizational plaintiffs. One is called the Middle Eastern Studies Association. And the third one that I want to tell you about, because this is a place where people often say, well, you know, how do you remain optimistic with thing after thing coming out of the administration keep being you know, so you know, horrible? Um, the second named plaintiff in this case, if you look at the complete complaint below, is an organization that's called HIAS, H-I-A-S. That stands for the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Okay, so what do Jews have to do with this? Well, what their CEO says, and he wrote a great blog for the ACLU website, he said, this organization was founded in 1881 to help Jews who were fleeing pogroms. And then in the 1930s, one of our chief missions was to help Jews who were fleeing Hitler's Europe. He said, we cannot stand by and watch the same thing happening today to Muslims. So isn't that you know, a kind of a great involvement? So the Supreme Court says, you know, well, what business is this of yours you don't have standing? Okay, so in addition to the IRAP case, there's also a second case before the Supreme Court, which is the, um, a, the case that uh, was filed by the state of Hawaii, which is also before the Supreme Court. There are four different issues that are in the cert petition. Question number one is, do the plaintiffs have standing? Uh, the case is called Trump versus IRAP, so you know that we all won below, so it's the administration that's appealing this. So we'll see what the court says about standing. Um, I think the problem here is that the Supreme Court has, they, well, they have another easy way out of the case, so I think they may not be that tempted to go with standing. Uh, there are a couple of cases last year where the court proceduralized very important issues, constitutional issues, and kind of you know, dumped them and got rid of them on procedural grounds, what I call abjudication. Uh, one of them was Hernandez versus Mesa, which was about whether a border patrol agent could be sued for having you know, killed somebody across the border. And what the Supreme Court said about that is, oh, you can't bring in actions under the Bivens case because blah, 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 special factors, Congress, this, Congress, so they never got to that. The court has never, you know, well, no court in the United States has ever heard on the merits any challenge by a victim of torture or extraordinary rendition because of procedure this and mootness and that and political question and qualified immunity and just all this kind of stuff. Also last year, the court got rid of three different cases brought by people who were detained, Muslims, who were detained in the fall of 2001 and were challenging the conditions under which they were kept. And the court said, oh, you know, Bivens this, qualified immunity that, and didn't get to the merits. So watch the procedures, because it's a way that the court manages to duck some very important constitutional questions. But as I said, the court has an easier path here, and that path is called mootness. Now, uh, I was saying that the executive orders, both of them, the original January one in March, were not supposed to be permanent. They were supposed to be give the administration 90 days to reconsider whether we're doing the right things, whether we want vetting to be more extreme, what we want our refugee policy to be. And so the second order, um, March 16th, effective date, uh, would have you know, the 90 days expired on June 14th. Okay, so the question is, is this moot? Okay, so one question is, when do you count from? If the order was uh, suspended because of the injunction, does that mean it's not moot because the time is still running? And the other really important question is if the court does find the case moot, as they well might, 
They might just decide to duck the whole thing and say, you know, 90 days are up. If the administration passes a new permanent policy that you think is unconstitutional, you know, come back then. They might say that, but the important question to watch in terms of what kind of precedent we're going to have here is whether they find the case moot and vacate the decision below, which would be a loss for IRAP and the plaintiffs, or whether they find it moot and do not vacate the decision below, in which case the precedents below would stand. Um, okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that, even though it's obviously an extremely interesting case in terms of constitutional litigation. But I want to spend my last two minutes talking about the Carpenter case, because this is also a very big case in terms of possibility of changing constitutional law. So what happened here was that Timothy Carpenter in Michigan was uh, convicted of robbery, and some of the evidence that they had against him was evidence that they had gotten from his cell phone pro provider. They issued an order to Sprint and another carrier to get all of the stored records of which cell phone towers he had been near. You all know how that works? It's like, you know, they can tell by the record of where your phone has been used what cell phone tower you were near, and therefore they can establish a pretty good sense of where you were then. So that's what they did, and they acted not under a warrant based on probable cause and in court, but under a statute called the Stored Communications Act, which has a much more lenient standard and allows them to get information from your cell phone provider just if it's, it's considered relevant and material to an ongoing investigation. So they got um, Carpenter's cell phone records for 127 days. And what the government argues is that's okay, and they argue that on the basis of a 1979 case called Smith versus Maryland. Smith versus Maryland involved the Maryland government that wanted information from a telephone provider about Smith's telephone records, what telephones he had been calling and what numbers he had received calls from. And what the Supreme Court said in Smith versus Maryland, which has haunted us ever since, has come to be known as the third party doctrine. The court said, well, Mr. Smith cannot reasonably expect privacy in the information about his telephone numbers because he shared those numbers with the third party. So if the government gets that information from a third party, you know, no harm, no foul. Why did that? Why did they need a, you know, a warrant? That's not even a search. How could he expect privacy? Well, the court has said that since about a lot of things, and I want to tell you that Congress reacted to that decision by passing what's called the, the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, the ECPA, saying, well, you know, okay, we want the government to really have to have you know, some respect for your private transactions. So the government has to do X, Y, and Z. Not as much as the Fourth Amendment would have required, but you know, something. So does the Electronic Communications Privacy Act protect your cell phone um, location information? No, it doesn't, for the simple reason that it has not been amended since 1986. Now, have there been any developments in electronic communications since night? Nobody knows whether or not the third party doctrine should cover the internet. Right, so there's a whole lot of stuff. You know, like, can they just talk to your, your um, service provider you know, right, you know, about what you're doing on the internet, you know, where you're surfing, what you're looking at? It's astonishing that you know, the Supreme Court hasn't looked at that, and neither has Congress. So there have been, a, there's a, re a recent case in 2012, the Jones case, where the court said that the government cannot get GPS information, you know, following your car around without a warrant. But that was a case where they directly got the information by putting a device on somebody's car, and then the device tracked the car and gave them information about whereabouts for 28 days. Justice Scalia was the fifth vote in that case, and he said the problem there has nothing to do with privacy. It has to do with the fact that they touched your car. Really, you know, that's a property violation. How dare they put a thing on your car? It's your car. Okay, so there are five justices in that case who talk about, wait a minute, you know, we're gonna have to get real here about technology and privacy. So watch the Carpenter case because it's a very important case about technology and privacy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill, for that nice introduction. I love these um, annual Constitution Day panels because, uh, number one, it gives us a chance to say happy birthday, Constitution, which turned 230 yesterday, 1787 and all that. Um, gives us a chance to talk about the Supreme Court and its role in interpreting the Constitution. Uh, and it also gives me a chance to hang out with my wonderful colleagues. I mean, you're so fortunate to have people of the caliber and the quality as scholars and as teachers and as activists in the world as uh, professors Ariza and Herman. Um, professor Herman and I go way back. Um, I remember when she was a summer law student uh, doing uh, work on ACLU cases when I was a lawyer there, <coughs> and her talk about um, 
pulling an all-nighter on a travel ban <clears throat> jogged my memory, and I'm always grateful for anything that jogs my memory. Um, <clears throat> When I was a young lawyer at the ACLU, I worked on a travel ban case, and I pulled an all-nighter. We pulled an all-nighter, and it's just coming back to me now. It wasn't somebody trying to come into the country. It was somebody trying to leave the country, and it was the mother of Sirhan Sirhan. Now, very few people in this room know who Sirhan Sirhan is, but he's the fellow, sadly and horribly, who assassinated Bobby Kennedy in 1968. His mother wanted to leave the country to go to a, some Middle East country to try to work out some diplomatic exchange for him or something like that, and the State Department wouldn't let her leave. And, and I can't remember whether the ACLU represented her or filed a friend of the court brief, but I remember that all-nighter. Uh, it was actually not, we, we quit at six in the morning, went home to take a shower, came back at eight and had our papers filed in the Southern District at, um, at um, Noon. So I'm pulling out all nighter in a travel ban case is not a new thing for the ACLU, and I, I appreciate your reminding me about it. Um, what I'm going to do today is talk about uh, three cases uh, that the court has. Uh, one that it will be hearing shortly, uh, two that it uh, decided uh, this past June, and the cases deal with uh, such small matters of the nature of elections in our democracy, the future of the uh, internet uh, in the 21st century. Uh, seeking refuge from our 18th century First Amendment, in our 18th century First Amendment, and the continued uh, adherence to the understanding that there is no hate speech exception to the First Amendment. Uh, those are three uh, rather significant issues, and I think it's fair to say that the people who wrote the Constitution 230 years ago may not have envisioned that the Supreme Court would have as, as prominent a role in resolving those questions uh, as it has now. Um, one of those men who uh, worked on the Constitution, uh, who helped write it but refused to sign it, was a man named Elbridge Gerry. He was a prominent Massachusetts politician, uh, and he wouldn't sign, he signed the Declaration of Independence, he signed the Articles of Confederation, but he refused to sign the Constitution, even though he worked on it, because it didn't contain a Bill of Rights. He must have been an early member of the ACLU, an early card-carrying member of the ACLU. He thought a Bill of Rights should have been part of the Constitution. Uh, but he had a very successful career, and, and sadly, in a way, uh, he was actually Vice President of the United States for a period of time. Um, his name is mostly associated with something that's not very nice, called gerrymandering. Gary became gerrymandering because, as a politician in Massachusetts, he helped create uh, some electoral districts uh, designed to help his party and hurt the other team, and the electoral districts shaped like a salamander, um, like a little lizard with tentacles here and everything there. And so uh, doing so became known as gerrymandering. And they are still at it today, 230 years later. Uh, and it is relentlessly bipartisan. Democrats do it to Republicans. Republicans do it to Democrats when they can. And you know the old joke about elections, that uh, in elections, voters choose their representatives, whereas in gerrymandering of electoral districts, the representatives choose their voters. And of course, that's what happens. Um, the Supreme Court, for a long time, didn't want anything to do with the issue, uh, referred to it as a political thicket, uh, invoked uh, uh, the political question doctrine to say this was not something uh, courts uh, could handle. But then slowly, the court started t uh, venturing into the field uh, when there were grossly uh, malapportioned districts, uh, 10,000 people in one district, 100,000 in the other. They each elected one representative. Uh, the court applied a one-person, one-vote principle to say that won't stand under the Constitution. Uh, when there was clear evidence of a predominant purpose of racial gerrymandering, uh, the court said that won't do and invoked the equality protections under the Constitution. But the question of partisan gerrymandering, try to make, trying to make the district so that your team will win and the other party will lose as much as possible, uh, as I said, the court has stayed out of that for a long, long time. Uh, they had a case about 30 years ago where some justices thought they might want to hear the issue but didn't think the proof of, of a permanent um, uh, fix or a permanent uh, uh, rigging of the system uh, was strong enough. Uh, other justices said, no, we shouldn't get into this at all. They invoked the political question doctrine. Uh, Justice Kennedy always liked to kind of leave the door open a little bit. He said, well, I don't think anybody has come up with a standard for deciding when a political gerrymander has gone too far and is now is unconstitutional, but they might come up with a standard in the future, so I don't want to close the door completely. And it reminded me of the famous line that Potter Stewart, Justice Stewart, issued um, uh, in a case, uh, some of my First Amendment law students will remember it, um, 
He said, I can't define obscenity, but I know it when I see it. And I think that Justice uh, uh, Kennedy has the same position about unconstitutional partisan gerrymandering. Well, in a case that the court's going to hear argument on two weeks from now, Gill versus Whitford, uh, the lower court found that there were intelligible, judicially manageable standards to identify a, um, a, 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 an unconstitutional partisan gerrymander, that the Republicans in Wisconsin uh, had violated those standards by uh, creating a system where they guaranteed they would almost never lose uh, the majority of seats in the state legislature, and the Democrats would almost uh, never win, uh, and that the court had to intervene and declare uh, uh, that kind of partisan gerrymandering to be uh, unconstitutional, that the Republicans had managed to arrange the district so uh, that it made it almost impossible for the Democrats ever to win a majority in the state legislature, at least for the foreseeable future. Uh, and the, um, the uh, uh, three-judge federal court, two to one, said that um, there was uh, enough proof to satisfy a standard uh, of, of partisan, of, un, uh, of unconstitutional uh, partisan um, uh, gerrymandering. And the case is now before the Supreme Court. There have been tons of briefs filed on all sides. Um, the Republicans say, no, we won those elections fair and square. We won it because we had better candidates and better issues and not because we stacked the deck uh, against, um, against the Democrats. Uh, and the, the, the lower court is just a, sort of a tool of the Democrats trying to make sure that um, Democrats um, win when they shouldn't. Um, so political thicket indeed, and it will be quite interesting uh, to see um, how the court deals with the case uh, when it hears argument. Of course, that's uh, often a, a clue as to how the, the case will be decided. Um, uh, I, would I would suspect the four more conservative justices will lean toward the uh, trying to stay out of it uh, uh, side of the ledger, political question, uh, that um, the, the four more liberal justices, to the contrary, will try to find and identify a standard to measure uh, that political gerrymandering which has gone too far and has to be struck down as unconstitutional. And as is so often the case in our contemporary constitutional times, uh, Justice Kennedy will probably be the, uh, I don't want to say swing justice, I understand he doesn't like that term, the, the deciding justice, the pivotal justice. Uh, and um, uh, it will be interesting to see uh, whether he has any questions at oral argument uh, and what they may be. Justice Ginsburg uh, was quoted as saying, that this gerrymander, this partisan gerrymander case, may well be the most important case on the court's docket this term, so say this semester, this term, uh, in terms of its impact on, uh, particularly if they decide that there is a, uh, a series of criteria that can be used to judge an unconstitutional partisan gerrymandering, the uh, ripple effect on uh, our politics and our uh, democratic structures will be um, uh, quite potent. So we'll have to see what the future holds. Uh, now, I, I want to uh, discuss two cases from the past, the recent past, this past June, uh, which I think uh, have great consequences for the future of the First Amendment. As I said, the first case involves the internet, uh, that 21st century technological marvel which helps bring the 18th century First Amendment up to date by really enhancing and, and uh, facilitating the, uh, the exercises of free speech and freedom of the press and freedom of association and freedom uh, to petition the government for redress of grievances. Um, in a landmark case 20 years ago, the ACLU uh, persuaded the Supreme Court that the internet was a vital new public forum and that normal First Amendment principles had to apply to limit government censorship of, quote, the vast democratic fora of the internet. Uh, the court agreed with that, uh, and the case was really a, 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 called Reno versus ACLU. Uh, was a powerful Magna Carta, really, for freeing up the internet and declaring that the First Amendment had to apply to it in a normal way. Just this past June, the court had another case that involved uh, uh, freedom of speech on the internet, a North Carolina statute, the case is Packingham versus North Carolina. A North Carolina statute said if you were a registered sex offender, you could not uh, access uh, social um, media on the internet if children were also able to access that media. And what it meant was this fellow um, could not uh, access Facebook or Twitter or other social media because he had once been uh, convicted of a statutory rape uh, as a young person. Um, and um, and uh, it's so interesting uh, how small uh, moments make big cases. Uh, what happened was he had beaten a traffic ticket 
and he went on the internet on a Facebook page say, hey, I really uh, beat a traffic ticket. God was on my side. I'm so happy. Thank the Lord. And there was some uh, police officer in Durham, North Carolina, who was investigating to see whether convicted sex offenders were using the internet. And even though this guy used a pseudonym, uh, somehow the police officer figured out it was the same guy who beat that ticket on a certain day. And sure enough, it was. And he was sentenced. Uh, he was convicted of uh, improper use of the internet. But what the court said was, uh, once again, as it had 20 years previously, that the internet was a vital part of the First Amendment landscape. Uh, the um, vast democratic forums of the internet had to be available pursuant to normal First Amendment standards. And while there might be more targeted regulations to deal with sex offenders and try to prevent uh, sexual abuse and sexual trafficking, uh, the, uh, basically a ban on access to social media for someone who was a registered sex offender was a classic example of an overbroad regulation that could not, uh, could not be justified. Uh, so, so far, so good. Uh, the internet seems to have the same protection so far as the court's concerned uh, that it had 20 years ago when um, the ACLU helped secure that protection. Uh, but despite the, um, the majority's um, praise for the internet in the North Carolina case, there are a lot of storm clouds gathering. Um, people on both the right and left are beginning to complain that the, uh, the major internet uh, actors, Facebook, Google, all of them, uh, engage in censorship uh, of one kind or another. Uh, so you're getting those complaints. Um, yesterday in one of the talk shows, former speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, said that maybe the um, uh, companies like Google should be regulated like, quote, gigantic public utilities. Uh, this is kind of deja vu. Way back when, people said that about broadcasting, that broadcasting was such a powerful medium that maybe the First Amendment shouldn't apply and government should have greater control, and now the same arguments are beginning to be made about, um, about um, uh, the Internet, uh, concerns about uh, Russian government use of the Internet to influence our elections. I'm old enough to remember when it was the Republicans who said the Russians were trying to influence our elections. And now that's sort of switched. The Democrats are concerned about that. Nonetheless, the uh, idea of um, protecting the internet uh, may be in tension with these concerns about the use of the internet for sort of political um, subversion. And a number of other uh, internet concerns are being raised. So my point is uh, that the, free, this is the First Amendment, the, the Supreme Court is on a strong First Amendment page where the protection of the internet is concerned. But I, I, I wonder whether the political community uh, feels the same way. And I, I suspect, of course, these uh, are powerful groups, Google and the like, Facebook. They have a lot of friends in Washington. Uh, whether they're uh, going to be able to resist serious regulation uh, uh, is unclear. Uh, but again, you have sort of a tension between what the Supreme Court has said the First Amendment requires when the internet is concerned and these various proposals and pressures uh, to, uh, to undercut free speech protection for the internet. And then the final case I want to talk about, and I think is a part of the same phenomenon, where I think the court is on one page, and I'm not sure the country is on the same page, and that deals with hate speech. Um, uh, the court had a case called Mattel versus Tam, involving the federal statute that banned the registration of disparaging trademarks. A group of uh, Asian American rocks, rockers wanted to uh, call their group the slants, a derogatory racial term, but they wanted to sort of own it and turn it around and use it for um, uh, less denigrating purposes. The, lower, the um, trademark office said, no, it's disparaging. Lower court said that violates the First Amendment. Uh, the most uh, uh, hateful thoughts are protected by the First Amendment. And the Supreme Court unanimously said that's absolutely true. Uh, the court said that uh, laws against disparaging uh, comments offend a bedrock First Amendment principle. Speech may not be banned on the ground that expresses ideas that offend. Uh, here's what the, the court said more specifically. Speech that demeans on the basis of race, ethnicity, gender, religion, age, disability, or any other similar ground is hateful. But the proudest boast of our free speech jurisprudence is that we protect the freedom to express, quote, the thought that we hate, quote. That's a phrase that Justice Holmes created to describe how it's not so important to protect thoughts we agree with, What's really critical is to protect and give freedom to the thought that we hate. Or as Voltaire supposedly said it, I disagree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Um, and the court not only uh, had a, a um, 
a plurality opinion that said that, but then Justice Kennedy, who's sort of the strongest free speech person on the court these days, I think uh, most would agree, um, wrote a concurring opinion to take an even stronger stance in, uh, in uh, opposition to government efforts to censor offensive or hateful speech. And he was joined in that by the three most liberal justices in the court, Justices Ginsburg, uh, Kagan, uh, and Sotomayor. So it's really interesting, the court was of one mind about how hate speech is not an exception to the First Amendment. Um, uh, I think, uh, I believe that. Uh, the ACLU believes that. I think it's believed it from uh, a generation ago when it represented the Nazis in Skokie uh, to a month ago when it represented the white power uh, groups um, in Charlottesville. Uh, and that's at the core of the First Amendment, that the most loathsome ideas, as long as they are put out in a peaceful and nonviolent way, uh, cannot be interfered with by government. Um, as I said, from Skokie to Charlottesville, the most important lesson to be learned is that if we do not protect the free speech rights of everyone, we will wind up having no speech right, free speech rights for anyone. But it's, I'm, I'm sort of sad to say, I think the Supreme Court believes that, but I'm not sure the majority of the, of the American public believes that. And so um, what I see is a coming clash in a way between what the court says the First Amendment requires and perhaps what the country feels or a majority of the country feels uh, the government is entitled to do by way of limiting free speech. And um, so finally, um, uh, it seems easier for our leaders to kind of condemn deplorable speakers and condemn the hate speech that they utter, uh, but forget the other part of the equation, namely uh, that we have to, quote, uh, defend to the death their right to say it. Thank you. So uh, I have a, um, a few cases that I want to talk about and then finish up with a, um, uh, a statement about maybe some current issues that are implicated by the Trump administration. I have to admit, though, um, I want to begin, and I was thinking about this when Professor Gora was, um, was wishing the Constitution a happy birthday. Uh, actually, yesterday is the anniversary of the Constitution's uh, finalization by the by the drafters. Uh, it took another 10 months or so bef before the Constitution was actually ratified and therefore became legally binding. And so um, I think whether yesterday was the birthday of the Constitution or not depends um, on whether one believes that life begins at conception or not. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> having said that, uh, let me talk a little bit about a couple of cases uh, that uh, um, that really kind of speak to the aftermath of the Obergefell decision from a couple of years ago that legalized same-sex marriage. So uh, one case that is currently on the court's docket uh, is a case called Masterpiece Cake Shop. And this is a case um, where a same-sex couple gets married uh, in Massachusetts before they were resident in Colorado, but they, moved, but they go to Massachusetts to get married uh, before, uh, before Obergefell. They come back to Colorado because they want a reception and they want a ceremony and, uh, and such, um, and they walk into a cake shop. Um, and uh, they walk in with a binder uh, full of cake decorating ideas for their wedding cake. Uh, and the baker, who is apparently someone that they knew and who had, you know, they'd worked with before on other matters, um, said, well, look, uh, I'll, I'll bake you lots of different things, but the one thing I will not give you um, is a wedding cake because that violates my views that uh, marriage is between a man and a woman. Um, so the couple sues uh, under state public accommodations law. So you may or may not know that a lot of states have these laws called public accommodations laws that prohibit discrimination in the provision of a public accommodation. For example, uh, you know, a store can't stop you from going in and purchasing things because you're of a certain race or gender or religion, or in this case, sexual orientation. Um, and so on the one hand, this is a pretty open and shut case of sexual orientation discrimination. The fact that this was a same-sex couple rather than an opposite sex couple meant that the baker was not willing to provide them uh, the wedding cake. On the other hand, uh, the baker um, has constitutional arguments on his side. So he argues, number one, uh, that this is a case of, um, of speech uh, and that when he creates a cake, uh, he speaks. Um, and by being forced or compelled by state law to create a same-sex wedding cake or a wedding cake that celebrates a same-sex marriage, he is being forced to convey a view that same-sex marriage is the kind of thing that one should celebrate, or indeed that same-sex marriage is a real marriage. Those are beliefs he doesn't, be that, uh, he doesn't hold, and for that reason, being forced to bake that cake 
under pain of having violated the Colorado Public Accommodations Law is, in his view, uh, a, uh, uh, an example of what's called coerced speech, right? Government requiring you to speak in a certain way uh, that, that violates your, your views. Um, if you've had First Amendment law, or even if you haven't, you may have encountered a, a case called Barnett versus West Virginia uh, uh, School Board. Uh, this was a the kind of foundational case for compelled speech. This was a case where uh, children, school children, were required every morning to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. There were Jehovah's Witnesses who uh, found that really odious to their beliefs, and they said that this was a case of compelled speech. Uh, and in 1943, in the midst of World War II, the court agrees with the children and finds that that kind of speech compulsion uh, is a violation of the First Amendment. So we have the Baker's argument on the speech side. We also have the Baker's argument on the compelled religious exercise side, whose so basic argument here is that he would be forced to associate himself um, uh, with religious viewpoints that with which he doesn't agree, that he would be forced essentially to go against his religious beliefs, to express things or views that conflict with his religious beliefs in a way that violates the free exercise clause of the First Amendment. So we have very, very compelling anti-discrimination arguments on the one hand. We have equally compelling First Amendment arguments on the other. And how the case turns out, may conceivably turn on some of the detailed facts of the case. I'll just kind of throw one at you before moving on to the second case. So interestingly, here's how the conversation went down, apparently, between the couple and the baker. So the couple walks in, and they say, hey, it's us again. Remember us. We're interested in a cake. And the baker says, great, what kind of cake? And the couple starts saying, oh, it's a cake to celebrate our wedding. We have lots of ice. And before they get the ideas out, the uh, baker says, no, 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 I just don't want to hear it. I will not bake that cake. Now, the point of that uh, idea is that there was no, apparently there was no particular design that the couple got out to the baker that, that they wanted on their cake. And so it, there's an argument, at least, that the couple is making that there really was no forcing a particular speech in here because the couple never had a chance to say, this is what I want you to say on the cake. And so there was no argument that the baker was being compelled to say certain words that he disagreed with. That's a real detail, but it may turn out that the court grabs onto that detail as a way of avoiding what otherwise would be a very, very difficult balancing between anti-discrimination law on the one hand and free speech rights on the other. One more quick thing about the case. It's kind of extraordinary. This was a case that was listed for consideration by the court, the cert petition, and then relisted and listed again and relisted and listed again. And it, 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 it took a long time before the court decided to grant review in this case. So it's quite interesting that the court seemed to hesitate and then decided ultimately to take the case. That's number one. Uh, number two, another case that deals with the aftermath of Obergefell, a case was actually decided last, year, last term, a case called Pavon versus Smith. This was a case out of Arkansas. So the story in Pavon is that uh, under Arkansas law, when a, um, when a woman gives, um, when a married woman gives birth, um, her husband is automatically listed as the, uh, as the father or, or as the second parent on the birth certificate. There are exceptions if, you know, she and the father, uh, sorry, she and the husband and the actual biological father all swear that the husband was not the father, then the biological father gets listed. But otherwise, the default is the husband is automatically listed as the second parent on the birth certificate. Um, there was a lesbian couple, in fact, two lesbian couples in Arkansas. Uh, the, um, uh, women in both of the couples give birth. Um, and the second parent, the second woman in the marital relationship, um, is not listed on the birth certificate because under, under Arkansas law, there's no provision for that. So uh, the couples bring suit. And the court, uh, the, the Arkansas Supreme Court actually upholds this, this distinction. Um, but the Supreme Court reverses um, in a summary decision. And this is kind of relevant, because a summary decision is one where there's no uh, briefing on the merits, where there's no, uh, there's no oral argument, because the case is so clear cut that there's no need to, to have all those formalities. So there is a per curiam opinion that strikes down the Arkansas statute, basically on the grounds that this law 
this distinction between the rights that, a, uh, that an opposite sex couple enjoy with regard to the second parent getting on the birth certificate and the rights that the same sex couple enjoy with regard to the non-birth parent giving, uh, getting on the certificate, that distinction simply denies same sex couples all the equal rights of marriage that Obergefell promised. There was a dissent the Supreme Court. So uh, Justice Gorsuch dissents, joined by Justices Alito and Thomas. Um, and he says, in part, well, you know what, it's not as clear cut as all that. I don't think summary reversal is appropriate in this case. But then he also kind of suggests some reasoning that Arkansas may have had for drawing the distinctions that it did. What that tells me is that there's still some resistance on the court to kind of a reading of a Burgerfeld for all it's worth and a reading of a Burgerfeld that gives same sex couples absolutely positively all the rights that opposite sex couples have. This is actually an issue that's percolating in the lower court. The, um, there's a case in uh, Texas right now where the city of Houston is being challenged for its decision to provide spouses of same-sex uh, city employees, uh, sorry, spouses of city employees who are in a same-sex marriage the same benefits that spouses of city employees in an opposite sex marriage enjoy. So essentially, Houston is trying to provide the same benefits regardless of whether the employee is in a same sex or an opposite sex marriage, and taxpayers in Houston are challenging that decision. And the Texas Supreme Court actually allowed that lawsuit to go forward. So the same kind of issue, what does a Burgerfeld really mean, is being litigated actively in the court despite Pavan. Um, one more case, and then just a brief kind of ending on um, on the Trump administration. Um, so there was a case from last term called Sessions uh, versus um, Santana Morales. Um, Sessions uh, dealt with the residency requirements for the, um, for the US citizen parent of a child born abroad for purposes of that child's citizenship. So in other words, hypothesize a situation where a child is born abroad and where one of the parents is a US citizen, the other parent is not. The question then becomes, um, what are the residency requirements for the US citizen parent in order for that child born abroad to have automatic US citizenship? If the two parents are married, then the US citizen parent had to have been in the United States resident for a period of five years. If the two, US, uh, 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 if the two parents are unmarried and it's the father who's the US citizen, then that father had to have been resident in the US for five years. But if the two parents are, are not married, and it's the mother who's the US citizen, she only had to be resident in the United States for one year in order for US citizenship to be conferred on the, uh, on the child. And the interesting question is, what's that all about? What's that gender distinction all about? The court strikes down that gender line uh, by a vote of seven to two, well, really, six to two to one, I believe, although the two didn't reach the merits of the case, and one was Gorsuch who hadn't joined the court yet. What's interesting about the opinion is that not so much the result, but it's the tone of the opinion. So if you've, if you've had con law, it may well be that your last exposure to the court's sex equality jurisprudence was a case called Wynn versus INS from 2001, dealing with a somewhat analogous situation, but not exactly. Uh, what's really interesting is that Justice Ginsburg's analysis in Sessions, uh, um, uh, in Santana Morales, was a really sophisticated, nuanced understanding of the underlying stereotypes that pervaded this gender line. I'll just say it really quickly, and then I'll say one quick word about Trump, and then I'll be, uh, I'll be quiet. So um, the essentially, Justice Ginsburg decides, or describes, rather, the underlying philosophy of this gender line as follows. When the mother is the US citizen, a one-year residency requirement is really all you need. Because after all, everyone knows that in the case of an unwed couple, the father's probably not even going to be there. And so all you really need is a very short residency for the child to likely uh, uh, get the attributes of US citizenship or the kind of to be really Americanized. When it's the father, on the other hand, that's the US citizen. Well, you know the mother is always going to be in the picture. And that if the mother is an alien, you absolutely want the father to be really Americanized. And that's why you want him to have lived in the country for five years. And Justice Ginsburg sees right through that. She demolishes that as really stereotype thinking about the roles of mothers and fathers when they raise children. And that's a real interesting change of tone from the Wynn case from 16 years ago. OK, uh, I'm just going to say I promised 30 seconds about 
all the constitutional issues raised by the Trump administration. And I want to say it, not by talking about them, but by, but by kind of dividing up those issues into three components. I want you to think, and Professor Gore was talking about this in the gerrymandering context, I want you to think about justiciable uh, constitutional issues, that is to say issues that courts can, in fact, can and do in fact resolve, non-justiciable constitutional issues, for example, like the gerrymandering issue, which up to now had been considered to be a non-justiciable political question, and finally, uh, issues of norms, right, which aren't really constitutional at all in the sense of being textually required, but they're part of the system. And the, when you hear about challenges to the structure that the Trump administration is posing, challenges to our constitutional structure, think about divvying up those challenges, categorizing them as one a court would likely reach, one a court probably won't reach even though there is a constitutional rule, and one that a court won't reach and for which there really is no constitutional rule, it's really just a norm. And when you think about that, in the context of Constitution Day, whether this is the birthday or whether this is only the conception day, think about our responsibility as citizens to kind of make decisions even about constitutional norms, even when they're not textually mandated. Okay, all right, I will have a Q&A right now with him. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a very, very, very quick word from Dean Allard. Pardon me. I, I thought it would be useful for you to have a heads up, a preview on issues relating to judicial nominations and confirmations that are heating up as it relates to what we're talking about, and which will likely arise during both semesters of this new term. Um, so yesterday, I, at, as some of you may have seen when we were at the book festival, I ended my interview with uh, Norm Ornstein about his new book, Life. Uh, uh, after Trump, I guess, is the new book, basically. And I asked, is, the tr is Trumpism, it's a multiple choice bar exam question, is Trumpism A, uh, an off-ramp to a new America? B, is it a wall? C, is it a speed bump? Or D, is it a piece of sand uh, that makes the pearl? You know, something new and beautiful. Uh, and whatever the answer is, the point is that presidents come and go. and lifetime appointments for federal judicial uh, uh, officers are extremely contentious and very, very important because they have this long-lasting effect. Now, two issues that are in the news that are among those, you're all aware of the, at the end of the Obama administration, there was not a hearing for the D.C. Chief Judge Merrick Garland, but there was uh, confirmation after the election for uh, just now Justice Gorsuch. And that really struck a nerve. Now, there's two issues right in the news now that are going to continue. The first relates to the norm, um, which is really not even a Senate rule, but it's the practice of the Senate Judiciary uh, Committee Chair Grassley, a uh, longstanding practice of the blue slip. And <clears throat> this is a process whereby a nominee under the existing practice, unless they get a blue slip delivered, which means I approve from the two home state senators, the nomination usually does not go forward. Now, the interesting thing about this anachronism is that um, the filibuster, the ability of a minority in the Senate to completely block at least Supreme Court and probably Court of Appeals candidates has been almost eliminated completely. So this anachronism uh, would allow one senator uh, to do what a minority of his party could not do. And this arises because there are 144 vacancies, 115 district court, and uh, the rest, uh, almost the rest, court of appeals nominees to fill. These are largely existing. There's so many vacancies because the Republicans al did not allow the vacancies to be filled. And the Democratic Party now, with the 45 that are ready for hearings, have basically not issued blue slips, most recently in the case of uh, Minnesota uh, candidates for the bench. So this is heating up, and McConnell has indicated that he's going to do away with the blue slip. I would just urge you to think very carefully whether, you know, when people are pining the loss of this blue slip, whether it actually is a practice that is democratic or worthwhile. Have an open mind and think about it. It's not so clear cut. You know, you can make an argument that preserving the dead hand control 
uh, of a president that's no longer there uh, benefits equally both parties and helps um, smooth things out when there's divided government. The second uh, is very recent, and this is the criticism that conservatives and even uh, someone who's believed to be liberal but is a constitutional scholar, president of Princeton University, Chris Eisgruber, criticized the Judiciary Committee for applying a religious test, litmus test, on candidates like um, uh, Professor Amy Barrett from Minnesota, who's been nominated. She was asked questions by Senator Feinstein uh, relating to her Roman Catholic faith and other senators, including Franken. So this is an explicit provision in the Constitution, Article 6. And so keep an eye out for this debate, whereas, and Feinstein, to my knowledge, I just saw her on television, has not backed down from the need for her to take this position, which, you know, at first blush is very, very problematic uh, under the explicit terms of Article 6 uh, in the Constitution. So keep an eye on these contentious fights about not only what the cases will be and how they'll be decided, but who becomes the judges and justices under the federal system. That's all. So we have a couple of minutes for, 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 for Q&A. Yeah. So in regards to the uh, baking case. Yeah, uh, yeah. When people cite their religious beliefs as a reason to not do something. Oh. Oh. As a reason to not do something. Are they, I mean, is the court looking at religious text or is somebody just saying, I derive these amorphously from my religion? Because if that's the case, I mean, couldn't you just say, my religion says I don't have to, you know, anything you, you say I don't have to do? Yeah, so, you know, there's a, so it's a very, very deep question that basically can be restated as, does a religious belief have to be accepted by some, some ecclesiastical authority in order for it to be considered constitutionally relevant, right, as a protection? And the answer is fundamentally it does not, right? I mean, the court, uh, and, and you can understand why that might be. Look, you know, it would, be, it would be really wrong for a court to say, well, you say that your Catholicism compels you to act or believe a certain thing, but, you know, we've consulted the catechism of the Roman Catholic Church, and we, the court, think you're just wrong. So that would, that, that would be an involvement with the courts with, with religious dogma. That would be completely itself a violation of the Establishment Clause. So the, the short answer is no. But of course, that raises all kinds of difficult questions about, well, what about my belief that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually divine and that my followers uh, need to do the following things if they want you know, to, you know, to, to gratify me, if, I, if they want salvation? And that's a really hard question that the court grappled with in a case in 1944 where a guy named Ballard said, you know what, I'm the second incarnation, literally, of George Washington, and here is what you should do to worship me. And he was brought up on fraud charges. And the court was deeply split about whether, they should, whether the court could say, the trial court, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you know that's got to be completely bogus. Of course it's fraud, right? Because otherwise that's the court sort of inquiring into dogma. In terms of hate speech and how that is permissible speech, right. it seems like today hate speech is running up against the fighting words doctrine. Right. And kind of how do we navigate this area when a group that is, kind of, it's hate speech only, but leading to people acting violently? Well, that's a good question. And you're right, they, they do tend to, um, the two concepts, protecting hate speech, but disallowing fighting words, um, can bump up against each other. And I think. My answer would be the court has come up with a very uh, narrow and strict definition of what can be punished as fighting words. Basically, face-to-face, -face, uh, maybe even personal insults, highly likely to cause the average person to take a poke at the person saying those things. Um, so if, if you had a situation where uh, some hateful thing, racial or similar hateful thing, were said in, in a circumstance that would fit that, then I guess a proper prosecution or, or prohibition of the, um, the hateful fighting words um, uh, would be allowed. But it's really not because, uh, not because they're hateful, but because they're fighting words. Um, but yes, I mean, I think it, it's, it's not an easy question. Of course, there are a number of exceptions to free speech. Uh, incitement is an exception. Tr true threats is an exception. Fighting words is an exception. Um, but I think what the court has been trying to say is, unless the strict tests that we've laid down 
for what comes within those narrow categories. Unless those tests are met, you can't simply punish words or ideas because they're horrible, hateful, or offensive. Other questions? Okay. Do we anyone else before we get to second our, round? Right? Second round. Okay. Great. You're you're on. The travel. Um, was there any deliberation? I mean, I know if I understand correctly, the main kind of loose justification was terrorist activity in certain countries. Um, was there any discussion in the courts about why certain te you know certain countries that had been explicitly linked to terrorism, to harboring harboring terrorism, were not on that? Ban. I mean, I think Saudi Arabia and Pakistan are not on that, and yet there's been tons of evidence to suggest those governments are complicit with terrorist activity. So was that discussed at all in terms of undermining the argument made by the, the Trump administration? So let me answer that in three parts in terms of discussed by whom, because the Trump administration itself discusses that in the second iteration of the travel ban. And they try to make out the case that the six nations remaining that are, you know, the banned nations are terribly, you know, they're just terrible, they're connected with terrorism. And the case, if you look in the order itself, is very flimsy. There was once this, and, you know, sort of not very reliable. So there was certainly discussion within the administration after the fact of whether they could justify the choice of those six nations. Um, Within the ACLU, this is sort of you know, a little bit of inside baseball here, but people were very uncomfortable with the argument that the problem with this ban is it doesn't go far enough. And, you know, let, let's also you know, bash the, the Syrians and you know, the Saudi Arabians and you know, whoever else. So you know, people were not comfortable with that, but there was some discussion in the court, certainly an oral argument, about whether the government had a sufficiently compelling interest to be you know, discriminating on the basis of religion. You know, that was also you know, an issue, is this in fact discrimination on the basis of religion. But there was a lot of discussion about whether the government's rationale held up in terms of their showing that these nations were a particular threat to national security, and the courts didn't buy it. Anything else? Okay, well look, thank you for coming. Really delighted that you attended, and uh, stay tuned for an interesting term. Good job.